Hello, it is a pleasure to be here with Cell Science Systems speaking today on methylation genetics. What I hope through this presentation is that most of all clinicians understand methylation genetics a little bit more and that any fear that may be present looking at genetic reports will be markedly decreased. So we're going to be discussing some epigenetic influences on methylation, sequencing of some micronutrients for benefits of our patients, reviewing selected enzymes that appear in methylation genetic reports, and then some ways to bypass some selected genetic mutations commonly known as SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms. Those are the genetic mutations that we frequently see on genetic reports. And so this particular um, example does show a genetic report that perhaps many of your patients have been walking in with asking you, what do we do with this now? And so through this conference, what I hope is that I give you confidence in how this report is presented and some pearls as to how you can interpret this report for patients. Very specifically, when you look at a genetic report and you see these different colors appearing, green, yellow, and red, what green means is that that particular enzyme is normal. It's normally expressed in, in that particular individual. Yellow, however, is a genetic mutation that is interpreted such that only about 60% of the maximum capacity for that enzyme to be expressed is possible at that genotype. Red, it's only 40%. So the more colorful a report comes back, that would indicate more of a problem with expressing of that genotype. On this particular example, as you can see, the GAD1 enzyme is listed here, and we see about 11 different lines, and what this represents are genotypes. It's not that there are 11 different GAD1 enzymes. It's like a facet of a diamond ring. The diamond ring is only one rock, but there are different facets in the diamond, and the different facets are what is utilized throughout the body at different locations. So in this GAD1 enzyme, what we can see is there are many facets, and those particular facets are being utilized in different areas of the body. Under GAMT, as you can see, this is two reds back to back. And so commonly this would be called, quote, double homozygous, in that this particular report shows an individual that is plus plus at both genotypes that are being expressed. And so this particular person, maximum capacity is the GAMT enzyme functioning at only approximately 40% capacity. If you go further down this report and actually look at the, toward the bottom of the report at the GSR, many enzymes only have one genotype. And I become particularly concerned when I see a genotype where there might be only one genotype um, evaluating. And if that is particular homozygous or heterozygous, then that can become a problem. So now we're seeing a, gem a genetic SNP report, a summary report that with some denotions, denotations of different enzymes. And we can see plus, plus, minus, minus. Again, the green minus, minus is a normal expression of that particular gene enzyme at, at that point. A yellow plus minus is heterozygous, 60% capacity, but a plus plus red means only 40% capacity maximum for that individual is possible for that gene expression. And in here I've summarized several different enzymes and the pertinent area of concern that a clinician may review when looking at a genetic report. As you can see here on the right side of the um, slide, I've highlighted some of the histamine enzymes and further down mitochondrial enzymes that I look at for the type of vitamin B12 that I'm very interested in, SAMe enzymes on the left side of the page, and so on. An individual may bring in a genetic report 
looking at isolated enzymes or a particular topic such as detoxification or cardiovascular or histamine, for example, or they may bring in a very large set of pages that have many, many enzymes. So becoming familiar with both a smaller report as well as a larger report could be helpful for you in your practice. So let us move forward and look at some different enzymatic genetic pathways. I will be using in this presentation two different methylation pathways, and I want to give you resources for your research and knowledge. The first one I'm going to be using is by Dr. Amy Yasko, and you can find more of her work and this pathway at knowyourgenetics.com. This is Dr. Yasko's website. She has given me permission to use her methylation pathways as long as I also give her credit for this. She has been the great pioneer in this area. The second pathway, which is much more detailed and much more extensive, as you can see, is by Dr. Ben Lynch. You can also find his work at seekinghealtheducationalinstitute.org, and he too has given me permission to use his work with proper credits given to him. So let us move forward and let us discuss a little bit more about methylation and why the interest in methylation. As you can see, methylation has become a very broad topic in medicine and science ever since the human genome was sequenced and released in the 1990s and around the year 2000. And the reason it's been so significant is that what we now begin to realize is that genetics, particularly methylation genetics, is the foundational mechanism of health and disease. So if we know our genetic mutations, many, many of our problems can be bypassed. I frequently tell clinicians the single most important piece of information, health information, that you can possess, that your patients can possess, is to know where's the blockage of the genetic mutation so that you can circumvent that particular mutation. So let's understand the basics. For the longest time, we have been talking about health and disease as a problem of our lifestyle choices, such as for breakfast, if you eat a dozen Krispy Kreme donuts, or if you eat oatmeal or bacon and eggs, it's going to make a huge amount of difference over the course span of your lifetime. What we now know is that environmental toxins are complicating the picture of our lifestyle choices but most recently it's this genetic impact and very much so the environmental toxins interrupting the function of our genetics. So if we can get a handle on our genetics, that's the first step toward greater health and wellness. Epigenetics is the study of the non-inherited genetic mutations that we can incorporate within, within our lives. And methylation is the process that is most understood. It regulates gene expression, it is influenced by our, uh, our environment, and it's simply, as you can see in this slide, a methyl group, an ME group, attached on to the DNA. The big pearl of methylation is that if methylation proceeds without restraint, it can become extremely problematic. And what methylation does is it inactivates the gene sequence. And as you can see here, with the genes switched on without methylation, they can just go random and wildly uh, in progression. With methylation, methylation will silence and turn off genes so that the genes can act more, most appropriately within our body. Some of the signs and symptoms I've listed here that methylation is known to be associated with, and as you can look at this list, it goes everywhere from diabetes, metabolic syndrome, mental health uh, problems such as anxiety, depression, insomnia, ADHD, to dementia and chronic problems, including sensitivity to medications, foods, and our environment. So 
what I hope you can appreciate is how fundamental it is to understand the process of methylation and why it is such a critical, helpful tool that can lead your patients to the answers that they need for some of their most difficult health problems that frankly have eluded uh, Western medicine. Instead of, instead of giving a prescription medication, if we can understand the genetics and help our genetics and our cofactors, perhaps many, many me medications can be done away with. So let's go forward and talk about a specific methylation problem I just want to highlight, and it's the growing, the growing problem in our society with fertility. As you can see from this graph, fertility has decreased by 40% in the last 10 years. That is a very serious fate for the human race. If we, if we don't get a handle on this, we can only expect greater, greater problems. And as you can see from this graph, it goes across all nationalities. It's not just Caucasian, it's Caucasian, it's Hispanic, it's um, Afro-American, it's the, the black individuals. So it's across all nationalities that we are seeing this. The biggest question is why? Why is there such infertility? For the longest time, we've always thought of infertility as a woman's problem. But as you can see from this graph, it's men and it's women. It's not either. But we also see a very succinct and identified cause of infertility occurring. And when we look specifically at male infertility, we can see that there is a very large um, percentage, 35 40%, of causes that we just have not attributed uh, a finding to yet. So it really is significant that we should be looking in these areas. And the newest, most recent research is showing that environmental toxins could be the guilty culprit in this, specifically BPA out of plastics, um, phthal phthalates and parabens out of cosmetics, out of antiperspirants, uh, out of many food and storage containers, all contain these environmental toxins. They're called xenobiotics, xenotoxins, and the problem is that they will chop off the function of methyltransferase enzymes so that those methyl groups don't get added the way they should be in methylation. This particular citation talks of the problem with recurrent pregnancy loss, <clears throat> excuse me, in individuals and the, the methylation mutation um, genetic SNP that occurs with MTHFR has been cited to be a very important guilty culprit in this. Both the C677 genotype and the A1298 genotype are involved with this and gratefully is that this particular enzyme defect mutation can be bypassed if, if we know that someone has this genetic mutation. It can be bypassed by an individual taking methylfolate. Methylfolate, not folic acid, but methylfolate will bypass this particular genetic mutation and we may have uh, much fewer recurrent pregnancy loss in that occasion. So let's go on to the pathway planner. Um, and what we know is that genetics is important. Methylation is a particular aspect of genetics. And for the methylation genetics to be occurring appropriately, we also have to have vital nutrients, which are the cofactors for these genetic enzymes to work appropriately. For example, you may have perfect genetics, very few of us do, but you may, you may not have <clears throat> significant genetics, but your enzymes will not work unless you have the particular cofactors. And when you look closely at this slide, you may recognize some of the minerals, zinc, magnesium, manganese, are some of the essential cofactors for particular enzymes to be working appropriately that you have to have. 
So what is methylation? What do we mean when all of this occurs? Simply, it's adding of a CH3 group, a methyl group, um, to uh, another molecule. And in this particular instance, um, a methyl group would be added to the uracil molecule to make thiamine. It's, and this is the, the group function, the homework function of the methyl transferase enzymes. That's where we get the term methyl transferases. They are transferring a methyl group to uh, another molecule to make a new molecule to be occurring. Let us review the functions of methylation. And as you can see here, there are seven that I've listed, everywhere from gene regulation, detoxification, immune regulation, nerve myelination, energy production. As I go through these seven areas, think of what would happen if any one of these areas were missing in our body due to a methylation um, problem. A, uh, an absence of appropriate methylation. What would happen to us? We would be very sick. For example, if we were not able to detoxify, toxins would build up, cancers would result. If our immune regulation were not able to function normally, we would be a very ill individual. You can't live without energy production and so on. So if any one of these seven were missing, if methylation were missing, it would come to be incompatible with human functioning and with a healthy life. So as we look at the human genome, we know that there are about 21,000 genes and a possible conglomeration of anywhere from 1,000 to 1 and a half million possible SNPs, genetic uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms. On this particular chart, all of the different ovals represent different enzymes. Now, at first glance, when you look at this, you may be overwhelming, but let's break it down so that you can understand some familiarity with this, and so the, this different pathways they may become more friendly. So as we look at this same pathway, here's the Krebs cycle. We know that this is where energy is formed. Here's the urea cycle, where we process ammonia the neurotransmitter cycle, where our most common neurotransmitters are formed. The words serotonin and dopamine and norepinephrine live in this particular cycle. Here's the folate cycle, otherwise known as the uh, methylfolate cycle. That's where the most common enzyme, MTHFR, known to science, is, is located. It's that beautiful blue at the end of, at the bottom of the circle, MTHFR. Here is the methionine cycle, an extremely important cycle. It contains both SAMe production and the production of homocysteine. <clears throat> and then lastly, the transsulfuration pathway here at the bottom. So let's put them all together. And what you will see is when they all uh, are put together on one screen, but they're given titles and you recognize the different functions of these cycles, they all flow one cycle into the other and they're all functioning at the same time. They're all friends of each other, they give electrons and um, molecules to each other, and it's essential that they work smoothly or that's when illness can, can develop. <clears throat> So when we do an assessment, when, when I start to work with an individual, the two things that I like them to um, obtain for me is a nutrient assessment, such as on the left, which is a list of frequent vitamins that I want information on. Some of these vitamins are cofactors for some of the enzymes. And on the right, I've listed several different genetic um, results, and again, the different colors, the green is a normal genotype, yellow is heterozygous, 60% capacity of expression, and the red is considered homozygous in which both parents have had a genetic mutation in the allele that, that developed this enzyme, and it's only 40% capacity. So in the nutrient evaluation, I optimally 
like to have both vitamins and minerals assessed. The minerals are cofactors for many of these enzymes, particularly zinc, copper, manganese, and magnesium. In particular, different enzymes will see some of those coming forward, and I'll be commenting on them. And what we know is that if you give the right nutrients, very frequently, many, many times, we can stop medications. This was a particular tech study done by Dr. Mark Houston. He's the director of cardiovascular antihypertensive research at Vanderbilt out of Nashville. And what he has been able to document is that by replacing the correct nutrients and helping our genetics work more efficiently, that he was able to discontinue antihypertensive medications within six months and over 60% of the patients involved in the study. That is a huge result. And it, I think it's one that our society and our health clinicians need to be aware of is that if we learn to use genetics and learn to use nutrients appropriately, we can minimize the need for many drugs and also help our patients to a better health status. So I next want to go through the five basic steps that I evaluate when looking at a genetic report and working with a patient of how to advise them going forward. Again, we evaluate the patient, we ask for their symptoms, we do a timeline of when their problems started, what were the significant events, and then I ask for two tests. I ask for the nutrient analysis, and I ask for a methylation genetic profile. And again, a reminder that all of this in methylation occurs inside the cell. It really does not matter what level of nutrients are occurring in the serum. We want to know what is inside the cell. <coughs> all of this occurs in methylation, and it occurs primarily in the liver. So um, the, the levels of your B vitamins, your zinc, your vitamin B6, excuse me, <coughs> are critical to understand of what is going on inside the cell. So then I start downstream. This is my very first step that I look at. This is the transsulfuration pathway because if we, if we institute therapies upstream but are not assured that the downstream is open, then we can do more harm to a patient, and we, we absolutely don't want that. So the very first enzyme, enzyme that I look at is SUOX, the sulfate oxidase enzyme. SUOX, it's uh, denoted as a, as a mauve-colored enzyme there at the lower right-hand corner, is the enzyme that converts sulfites to sulfates. Most importantly, molybdenum is the cofactor for this particular enzyme to work. Now, I rarely see this enzyme ever being abnormal. I've only seen it abnormal, I think, twice as a heterozygous in the last 10 years. So it's very rare that this enzyme is a problem. What I do see very frequently is that people do not have molybdenum. So I always ask a patient, first off, first step, to start a small dose of molybdenum to make sure that this pathway is open. And by a small dose, I encourage my patients to take approximately 75 micrograms, MCGs, micrograms, twice a day. This will assure that those sulfites are moving through the pathway so that we can um, not cause damage once this transsulfuration pathway is further opened. Now, the problem with sulfites, let me review that for just a moment. If sulfites increase, what ends up happening is that the sulfites block the GAD enzyme. And in the very lower center part of the pathway, what you will see is where I have, have typed in sulfites blocking GAD. GAD stands for glutamic acid decarboxylase. Here's why it's important. It, it converts, it is the enzyme that converts glutamate to GABA. 
if sulfites increase and then shut off GAD, glutamate will increase. And glutamate will skyrocket dopamine and norepinephrine. So the very first step that I encourage is to start with a very small dose of molybdenum to help keep sulfites under control. In addition, many of my patients have gastrointestinal um, dysbiosis. They may have SIBO, they may have a leaky gut. And so many clinicians are introducing glutamine to help heal a GI tract. That is fine. Glutamine does help to, to fortify and heal a leaky GI tract. But I always advise making sure that the GAD enzyme has not been blocked by sulfites. So when I work with an individual with a leaky GI tract, I add, first of all, that molybdenum so that they can tolerate their glutamine. And glutamine can be a healing nutrient um, in their thera therapeutic re recommendations. So here on the Pathway Planner, again, this is um, from um, Dr. Lynch's work, is the SUOX enzyme. And if you look very carefully, I'm going to try to put a tracer on it. Right here, um, you can see that the cofactor is molybdenum, and right next to it is vitamin B1. The research shows that you need a little bit of vitamin B1 in order to absorb molybdenum through the GI tract. So I always make sure that, that an individual is taking a good multivitamin that's got adequate thiamine. B1 is thiamine so that then the molybdenum can be absorbed and can enable the SUOX enzyme to be functioning as appropriately. And again, this is a... Um, from, the, from the medical literature, the CBS enzyme is the enzyme, I've circled there at the top of the red box, is the enzyme that opens the transsulfuration pathway. And the thought is, is that when CBS is abnormal, that it is an upregulated enzyme. And if it is upregulated, that will pour sulfur molecules down the transsulfuration pathway and potentially can lead to increased sulfites. So this is why when we start our interventions, we want to make sure that we're working with the transsulfuration pathway. So just in review here, CBS, this is Dr. Yasko's pathway where the red circle circles that gold enzyme, pours sulfites down the transsulfuration pathway, and the sulfites then are metabolized to sulfates with molybdenum so that the sulfites do not shut off the GAD enzyme. Because once that GAD enzyme is shut off, let's look at what happens. Glutamate backs up, and if glutamate backs up, Dr. Yasko describes glutamate as 40 times more inflammatory than any other mediator in the body. Glutamate will skyrocket norepinephrine, will turn on neuronal damage and microglial activation. So we have to make sure that, that, GA, that the GAD enzyme is working as optimally as possible so that this nerve damage, anxiety, panic, agitation, insomnia are kept to a minimum. All of those symptoms and problems that can be exacerbated by too much norepinephrine. So as a summary here now, I've put together uh, the seven problems that I see with too many sulfites in this transsulfuration pathway. Very specific, GI inflammation, blocked GAD enzyme, the increased glutamate that we've talked about that can lead to the increased norepinephrine that will then exacerbate neuronal damage, microglial activation, and can trigger histamine. That is a significant problem that is now becoming very widespread in that we need to realize that sulfites can trigger asthma attacks, can trigger histamine release, and it's because of the buildup of sulfites. So 
there are a few things I'd like to just mention can help calm down the sulfites, can help calm down the glutamate, and I've listed them here for your review and consideration. We can give resveratrol. Resveratrol is a wonderful supplement, but we have to be cautious because it does contain methyl groups. If you give too much resveratrol at one time, too many methyl groups can build up, leading to too much SAMe, which can then um, backfire and shut off our um, norepinephrine metabolism. So being cautious with that is wise. And acetylcysteine, L-theanine, lithium orotate, very low dose of lithium orotate, such as five micrograms per day, and magnesium. All of these will help to minimize glutamate in the body. So here we are. Now, this is back to our transsulfuration pathway. This is the second aspect of CBS. If CBS is upregulated, what is proposed by Dr. Yasko is that ammonia is generated when eating animal protein. And her recommendation is giving a little bit of yucca herb with meals that contain animal protein to help absorb that ammonia. The problem if we don't do that is that the ammonia will preferentially bind your BH4, the biopterin, to be neutralized, leaving your neurotransmitter pathway helpless. Then you can't generate your neurotransmitters. So if we can deal with the ammonia efficiently through nutritional supplementation, it frees up the BH4 so that the neurotransmitter pathway can function most appropriately. So the two problems with CBS, upregulation giving sulfates, and secondarily increased ammonia. The and I've summarized here the recommendations that I've just mentioned, the SUOX enzyme metabolizing sulfites to sulfates, needing a little bit of thiamine and molybdenum. Hydroxy B12 and vitamin E are thought to increase the, the rate of the SUOX enzyme. So you can push that enzyme if need be, but very few people have that enzyme abnormal, so I don't consider that a, a, a big need. The second enzyme that I look at is CBS. It generates sulfites and potentially ammonia, and the, that ammonia can be metabolized. Importantly, the cofactor for the CBS enzyme is vitamin B6. It's important to understand this, as that CBS opens up the transsulfuration pathway. It's the transsulfuration pathway that decreases homocysteine. Now, homocysteine is another very important topic, but CBS is the doorway to the transsulfuration pathway. So if you have an individual with elevated homocysteine, we want that transsulfuration pathway to be working and making sure that there's adequate B6 to open up CBS is critical. So let's go on to step number two. I mentioned earlier, I'm gonna to talk to you about my five steps. My step number two is to consider vitamin B12 for methylation. And as you can see, it's right here, center stage on the pathway planner. And here it is blown up and the MTR enzyme the genotype that is thought to be most critical is the A2756G, particularly if it is homozygous, plus plus. It is thought to be an upregulated enzyme, and this particular enzyme will be churning more rapidly using up your vitamin B12. So if you have a mutation in this MTR enzyme, extra vitamin B12 is critical to enable the, the B12 uh, not to be deficient for going on to help the formation of methionine in this cycle. And so if I see someone with low intracellular B12, I always go down the, the questioning as to why is there low B12? The very first question that I commonly ask is, are you vegetarian? The reason is that most vitamin B12 comes from animal protein. Secondly, could there be poor diet? You may be eating all of the animal protein you need, uh, but there might be poor gastrointestinal absorption also. 
Do you take a multivitamin? Could there be infections such as Helicobacter pylori absorbing that B12? A most recent um, journal just published an article in the last year that proton pump inhibitors decreasing acid content in the stomach will decrease your body's ability to absorb vitamin B12. In our older individuals, we frequently see intrinsic factor deficiency uh, causing a problem for the ability to absorb B12 in the stomach. And if that's the case, you can give B12 under the tongue. Vitamin B12 drops, B12 lozenges will be absorbed beautifully, given, given every day to, to bypass any stomach problems. And you don't have to give B12 injections. It's absorbed right underneath the tongue. And then the newest research from Dr. Amy Yasko and her work suggests that deficient lithium in our food, the two foods that are most common sources of lithium are potatoes and tomatoes. If the food that they're grown in is high, if the soil that they're grown in is high in lithium, and she suggests that deficient lithium in our diet gives us deficient lithium in our body and causes an inability to move B12 from the ser serum to inside the cell. So as a clinician, you may have individuals with very, very high serum B12 levels, greater than 2,000, for example. But if you test intracellular, they might be zero. And that would suggest the need for a small amount of lithium. And again, very, very small amounts, approximately four micrograms once a week would probably be enough. Many of my patients take it once every day. So as we, as we look here at another version of the methylation pathway, you can see this is Dr. Amy Yasko's work from her Simplified Protocol book from her website, knowyourgenetics.com. And as you can see right here, at the MTR-NTRR intersection between the folate pathway and the methionine pathway, you can see her suggestions. This is where you give B12 and a very low dose of lithium to help that B12 get inside the cell so that it can function. And I am moving very commonly now to looking at hair analysis. This is a sample of a hair analysis um, that is available on the market because it will show me um, a lithium level and a molybdenum level. And I'm gonna move my cursor right here if you can see this very long black line, and I'm moving my cursor over, this is this patient's lithium level. They have no lithium. And for someone such as this, I would expect that on an intracellular micronutrient test, their lithium level may, their vitamin B12 level would be very, very low. And if I drew a serum B12 level, it would be very, very high. So a test such as a hair analysis could be very helpful um, to detect some of these micronutrient levels. So again, so we've been, we've been talking about B12. And now for step three, what type of B12 to advise our patients? There are multiple B12s on the market. There's hydroxy B12. It comes in different formats as a lozenge, as a drop, and as a combination product in multivitamins. Adeno B12 is specific to the mitochondria. It's the type of B12 that is needed for the mitochondria to produce energy. And then there is methyl B12 that is also available. I'd like to present a clinical pearl, a discerning question that I always ask my patients and my clients even if I don't have their genetics. When I'm trying to discern what type of B12 to advise them to take, I will ask, do you suffer from anxiety? Do you suffer from insomnia? Do you have agitation? Um, do you have chronic constipation? Those are all clinical indications that an individual may have very elevated norepinephrine. And in, that would indicate a COMT enzyme mutation. And in those individuals, I will never give methyl B12. I will give hydroxy B12. So if there is anxiety, 
always be looking for giving hydroxy B12. Too many methyl groups, again, as we look at our pathways, too many methyl groups can make excessive SAMI, and SAMI, if there's too much SAMI in the body, can shut off the COMT enzyme, making norepinephrine worse. So if you're not sure, the best bet is to give hydroxy B12. And this is a chart from Dr. Yasko's work, her simplified protocol. I think it's on page 10 or 11 in, in her little pamphlet, Simplified Protocol. And as you can see, as we're looking at the COMT genetic enzymes, here as if you have a heterozygous or a plus minus, or homozygous plus plus, if you have uh, any of these, the, these SNPs present, you want to give less methyl B12, and you want to zero in on the hydroxy B12. Adeno B12, again, is for the mitochondria. And doing a combination product, hydroxy B12 and Adeno together, is, is available in the market, and it's, it's absolutely fine. There's no contraindication, but I know one for this. So let's move on to Adeno B12. I want to speak just a, a, a moment about the mitochondria and why the mitochondria and protecting the mitochondria is so important. It's very simple. If the mitochondria is under significant stress, the mitochondria will die. If sufficient mitochondria die, the cell dies. If sufficient cells die, that's the aging process. So we need to protect our mitochondria. The two enzyme genos types that I look at for this is the MMAB enzyme and the MUT enzyme. And if either a patient is heterozygous yellow or homozygous red, I always add in some adeno B12 as a little bit of extra insurance for the mitochondria. Here on the pathway planner is where we see that MUT enzyme. And here is, is a different uh, portrayal of a cell. So if you can just imagine that your cell is perfectly rectangle as this blue picture demonstrates and you have this large oval which is the mitochondria right here. Here's the mitochondria. Here's the MMAB enzyme and right here I'm circling the MUT enzyme. If these are mutated or if there are SNPs in these we have to be getting adeno B12, adenosyl B12, to increase the energy production through the entire mitochondria. And I've identified here where these different types of B12 are denoted here on this picture. As you can see, hydroxy B12, cyanocobalamin, which by the way, I tell all my patients, please put in the trash can uh, because too much cyanide is a problem for our bodies. It is considered uh, lethal uh, at a certain level. So I, I don't like uh, cyanocobalamin. It will shut off complexes in the mitochondria electron transport chain. But if hydroxy B12 comes in and it's progressing through, then it, it drops the hydroxyl group and comes down to form methylcobalamin, which then goes on to methionine. In addition, the, the cobalamin can come up attached to an adeno group and come up into the mitochondria to help with the functions of the mitochondria for energy production. So we need our micronutrients to have all of this working appropriately. And so at this step, and this is step number four, I add B vitamins and minerals, but not methylfolate. Again, we want to support our body levels of B vitamins and minerals, which are the cofactors for these different cycles in order to get ready for the methylfolate. Methylfolate then is my step number five, and I start low. We don't need to use a sledgehammer when kitchen spoon is applicable. And so I always start with methylfolate, 400 micrograms, once or twice a day, and then we can titrate up slowly if needed. Rarely is methylfolate needed more than three milligrams per day. I know that there are um, prescription medications on the market 
that have 7.5 and 15 milligrams available. But if you look at the genetics and make sure everything else is in place, then we don't need to be using such enormous amounts of methylfolate in our patients. And again, then this is the MTHFR enzyme here at the bottom of the folate pathway, as you can see, it's highlighted right here. And I want to talk about the MTHFR um, enzyme for just a moment. The three main functions of methylation, having this MTHFR enzyme function appropriately is for the regulation of methylation all over the body, for glutathione production, which we need for detoxification, and for the neurotransmitter pathways, recycling of your biopterin. And when we talk about MTHFR, the, the most famous of all these enzymes, it was the enzyme that was researched for neural tube defects. And it is why we have advocated folate when our vitamins and minerals for our prenatal vitamins to prevent neural tube defects. Um, there are two most common genotypes. There is the MTHFR C677, and as you can see, it is on the right-hand side. It is the facet of MTHFR that enables the, fo the, the folate for the methionine pathway. The second genotype is the A1298C genotype for MTHFR, and it enables the folate that is needed for the neurotransmitter pathway. So it's one enzyme, but two different genotypes that we're talking about. Um, it's not two different enzymes, but only one enzyme. But they function in different capacities. And again, here on the pathway planner, as you can see right here at the bottom of this pathway planner is the MTHFR enzyme. And what I, I would also would like to point out is where some of the um, problems have come in over time. Many uh, years in the past, we used to advocate folic acid. As you can see, folic acid here at the top of the pathway planner, if we give too much folic acid, that can block the receptors for methylfolate. So we don't want folic acid. In addition, folic acid can shut off some of these other enzymes, the DHFR enzyme. So we really want appropriate supplementation and really good multivitamins uh, with our patients, making sure that their multivitamins have methylfolate so that these blockages can't occur, and so that this methylfolate right here on this pathway, the product of MTHFR, can go onto the methionine pathway appropriately. What we know is that methylfolate is much, much more bioavailable, as demonstrated here, rather than um, folic acid. Folic acid has many, many steps it must go through in addition to blockages. So I write on my prescription pad for my patients, trash your folic acid supplements and trash cyanocobalamin. And by all means, get excellent quality nutritional supplements. So in summary, again, these are the functions of the MTHFR enzyme. It will elevate homocysteine. It will disrupt SAMe synthesis. Histamine metabolism is impaired because you need SAMe to metabolize um, histamine. COMT enzyme is impaired because, again, you need the SAMe, which will lead you to elevated dopamine and norepinephrine, and methylation impairment. And methylation impairment all over the body because every methyltransferase enzyme must have SAMe. So today we've been talking about methylation genetics and some of my favorite pearls and insights of how I hope that you will begin using methylation genetics with your patients and into the future. Thank you.